Hey everyone, welcome to our week two PS Pirate session. Um, today we'll be going over all of the week two content, um, excluding some of the stuff from HKS and um, some of the med law stuff, I think. So the topics we'll be covering today include uh, central dogma one and two, uh, cellular energetics, homeostasis and body fluids and fuels. So what we'll start with is I'll just start by getting into my presentation, which will be about the central dogma one and two. Um, the other two people presenting today will be Caroline and Claire. Um, so they'll take over for their slides when they get there. Um, just for the sake of time, because I know our last week's session ran a little bit over time, I'll try and keep my presentation to about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, but without further ado, let's just get started. So. The first thing <clears throat> in my presentation on central dogma is essentially the learning objectives. So I think it's really good when starting out with a topic to, um, you know, think about the learning objectives and try to put it into simple terms. So you actually know what you need to understand. So these are the learning objectives here on the left, um, describing the structure of DNA and its organization in the cell, blah, blah, blah. And then these are the simple terms, sort of simplified version of those learning objectives telling you in plain English sort of what you need to know. So we'll see that I'll go through all of these one by one, essentially in this presentation and cover all of them. But what we start with is what is the central dogma? So starting with the central dogma, the central dogma is essentially the process through which you have DNA and it is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into proteins, which then conduct various functions in the body. So that is just the central dogma. And when we talk about the central dogma, what we're referring to is this process and all of the in-between processes and how DNA actually goes from DNA to RNA and how the RNA creates a polypeptide. So that's what we're essentially talking about with when we refer to the central dogma. Okay, so the start, where we start with this is with the structure of DNA. So this is like the very small building block the thing that um, carries all your genetic information um, in your body in the cell. So we start with the structure of DNA and we realize, we learn that it has three main components. So there's a sugar, a phosphate and a nitrogenous base. So what we see is, um, if I should be able to spotlight. Yeah, so what we see is here, we've got the sugar molecule. Um, this is the phosphate molecule and this is your nitrogenous base here. So it's also good to know that DNA has a direction. So it has a directional nature to it, which is that one end of the DNA molecule is three prime and the other end of the molecule is going to be a five prime end. So those are the main characteristics of DNA. And the other main point is that the sugar is bound to the phosphate covalently, whereas the nitrogenous bases are bound by a hydrogen bonds. So since we know that... <clears throat> Um, covalent bonds are stronger than hydrogen bonds. This is important to know because that means that DNA, when it's arranged in a double helix, is much more likely to break by separating the strands rather than the sugar phosphate backbone actually breaking. So that's one important distinction to know. Um, and as you see, I've written on these slides whether I think the content is low yield or high yield. Um, I've written that the structure of DNA is low yield mainly because I think a lot of people already know this. Um, and if you don't, that's totally fine as well. But I think that <clears throat> in the general scheme of things, it's kind of unlikely that you get tested on this stuff directly. It's more the stuff later down the line that you get tested on. So now we talk a little bit about the functions of DNA. So there are a few essential functions, and then there is a structure that allows for that essential function to occur. So we start with these four essential functions, storing genetic information, precise replication, being readable for gene expression and being susceptible for, uh, to mutation. So <clears throat> the thing that allows DNA to store genetic information is obviously the nucleotide bases, the coding that, um, the coding that these nucleotide bases allow for. Then the next thing is going to be your nitrogenous bases, um, which is essentially the same as your nucleotide bases but it's the fact that they have hydrogen bonds that actually allow for DNA to be replicated because these hydrogen bonds can be readily broken and reformed. <clears throat> Next, we've got um, the phosphoribose backbone, which allows for it to be um, a very strong um, and reliable storage method. 
and you have the base complementarity. Okay. So now we move on to how DNA is actually stored within the cell. So the way DNA is stored within the cell, you can think of it as a small subunit that moves into, you know, a bigger subunit that moves into a bigger subunit, which moves up and up and up. So what you learn is that DNA is essentially the smallest subunit. And then <clears throat> DNA itself is wrapped around these histone proteins. So these ones here, that's what you see here. And eight of these histone proteins with DNA wrapped around them is called a nucleosome. So you have DNA, histone proteins, nucleosome. And then after you get these nucleosomes, nucleosomes are condensed and wrapped together to form chromatin. So oops, chromatin, that's what you see here. And then the chromatin is also condensed and that forms the chromatid and the chromosome. And then, you know, you have several chromosomes which produce the genome of the human body. And the genome refer refers to just all of the genetic information in a human body. <clears throat> okay. So now we move on to a little bit more of the high yield sort of stuff. So here we've got, how does DNA actually replicate? So this is the first piece of background knowledge that I believe is somewhat important to know um, when considering how you understand whether how DNA actually replicates. So the first thing to note is mainly in this diagram right here on the right. So what's important here is that you can, uh, both all, all types of DNA have an origin of replication. And essentially the origin of the replication is the only place where DNA can start to replicate. So what's important is that prokaryotic DNA is generally circular. So you only need one origin of replication because when you start replicating, you can just go all the way around and you don't need another origin of replication. However, eukaryotic DNA is linear, so it's not circular, it has two separate ends. And what that means is that if you started at one point of origin and you worked your way down, it would take a really long time to finish. And also um, you might not actually be able to complete all of the DNA. So what that means is that eukaryotic DNA has multiple origins of replication. And when we say DNA is replicating, it doesn't actually occur from just one point and occurs all the way down the strand. What's going on is that multiple origins of replication are starting with the replication of DNA and they're moving towards each other just like this. So the reason for this is um, that you get faster replication because you can start at several points simultaneously. And then also that there isn't one point of failure or one origin of replication where the um, replication of DNA could just stop happening if that was broken or damaged. Okay, so now we're moving on to the really, really high yield sort of processes of how DNA replicates. Uh, replicates. So the first thing here is that um, DNA helicase is an enzyme, enzyme, sorry, enzyme. So anything ending in A is you should usually think enzyme. So we've got DNA hel helicase. Uh, it starts by unwinding the DNA from the origin of replication. Then you have these single strand binding proteins, which hold the strands of DNA apart. And on the next slide, I'll have a nice diagram which represents this information. And then uh, the next step is that <clears throat> RNA primase binds to the DNA at the origin of replication. And it transcribes a short sequence of RNA primer in the three prime to five prime direction. So the important thing to know with a lot of these enzymes is that they always tend to run in the three prime to five prime direction. And you'll see that this is important a little bit later on. Excuse me. So then after you've got this primase sequence, our DNA polymerase is able to bind to this RNA primer and it can extend this strand with DNA in the three prime to five prime direction. And then finally, what you have is these RNA primer sequences are removed because obviously when you replicate DNA, you can't have these RNA short primer sequences in between them. Um, instead, what happens is they're removed <clears throat> and they're replaced by DNA ligase, um, which joins together all of the fragments. So if we go to the next slide, there will be a nice um, diagram here. So what you'll see is that this green section here shows you the RNA primer region. And this is what an RNA primase would actually look like. So what happens is DNA helicase starts the process by unwinding the DNA. These are your single stranded binding proteins, which keep the DNA strands apart and so that they don't reform and rejoin after they've been separated. Then what happens is you've got this primase, it joins, it's 
um, it works in a three prime to five prime direction. So you've got three prime here. So the RNA primase is going to join here, move in a three prime to five prime direction, leaving a primase um, primer sequence. And then DNA polymerase can bind onto this and then extend the strand in a three prime to five prime direction. So that's what, why it forms this red um, DNA strand here. Now, if we continue, we'll see that on this bottom strand, you see that now there's a five prime end here. So DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase and DNA ligase, they can all only move in a three prime for five prime direction. So what you see here is that you've got this RNA primer sequence given here, and it's moving in a three prime to five prime direction and it has to place it in this direction because otherwise, you know, the enzyme just can't work. So it has to place this RNA primer RNA primer sequence starting like this, and then DNA polymerase binds onto this and then extends that strand to the left in a three prime to five prime direction. Now, what happens as a result is that on the five prime to three prime end of the strand, what you get is this is called the lagging strand. And because it's the lagging strand, that means that you have these fragments of DNA because there are progressive like primer sequences because the primase has to keep jumping forward to actually place the primer sequence for the DNA polymerase to bind to. So what you get as a result is these things called Okazaki fragments. And these fragments are just these segments of DNA that are joined together by DNA ligase later down the line. So I think this is quite high yield and good to know because you will get some exam questions on this for sure. Okay, moving on. Uh, now, during this process, you might be wondering where does DNA, uh, where does the energy for DNA replication actually come from? So what it comes from is the hydrolysis of DATP, CA, CTP, DGTP, and DTTP, and these are essentially the triphosphate versions of the nucleotide bases. And what happens is you see this process here, where the um, phosphate base joins onto the three prime end, and as a result, in that process, the phosphate Phospho, phosphate iron is released and that produces energy and that is the energy that is used to actually give the process energy. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about how RNA primase, DNA polymerase and DNA ligase, they all move in the three prime to five prime direction. So what you see here is this strand, this original leading strand is a, uh, this strand here, the original leading strand is a three prime strand and so as a result, when the RNA primase is set, then the DNA polymerase can keep going and unwind all the way and just replicate this strand. However, on the lagging strand, this is five prime end. So RNA polymerase has to keep doing this and then making these Okazaki fragments. So as a result, that's why the direction of the DNA synthesis is really important when it comes to RNA primase, DNA polymerase and DNA ligase. <clears throat> So now we talk a little bit about what happens at the end of the strand. So because of that directionality problem, this actually means that um, at the end of a double stranded DNA, there will be a three prime strand overhang. So to explain why this happens a little bit, this diagram I think explains it quite well. So we've got this leading strand and the leading strand, the DNA polymerase can actually just extend all the way down to the five prime end. However, on the lagging strand, what you see is that the RNA polymerase has to keep jumping, jumping until eventually it will reach the three prime end of the strand. So when it jumps to the end of the three prime strand, there will be this area of primer at the end of the three prime strand that cannot be filled. And this, this is called the terminal gap. So at the terminal gap, what happens is that there is this three prime overhang, which means that um, this cannot be filled by DNA ligase because there's no place for DNA uh, ligase to actually join beyond the three prime end of the gap. So the next question is, how is this terminal gap actually filled? So the solution to this terminal gap is something called telomeres. So telomeres are these repeating DNA sequences used to cap the ends of double-stranded DNA. So the way that these are produced is that telomerase, which is an enzyme, recognizes the end of the three prime um, of the three prime sequence and it extends it with a repeating DNA sequence. So DNA polymerase then um, contains this is a different type of DNA polymerase, but this is beyond the um, out of the scope of you know what you need to know. But 
DNA polymerase containing an RNA primer subunit then binds to this telomerase um, extension, and then it can place some RNA primers. Then what happens is DNA polymerase extends this RNA primer sequence to the DNA strand. Excuse me. Now, this is a sort of diagram that can explain that for you. And you see that this is the telomere. This is your three prime overhang. And then what you see is that the telomerase can extend this. And this is a repeating sequence. So you've got the triple G double T. And you have a triple G double T. And then you have the RNA primer, which can connect onto this. And then DNA primers, uh, DNA polymerase can extend this and form your telomere. Okay. So that's essentially the process of DNA replication. And now you think about what issues can actually occur, which is a learning objective. So this is slightly more low yield, but there are three main ways that DNA is repaired and damaged. So you've got proofreading, which is the way that DNA polymerase actually proofreads the nucleotides that it's placing on the DNA strand. It has two proofreading mechanisms, one which is during the actual placing of the nuclei, nucleotides, and one which is straight after replication, which is this proofreading mechanism, which is correcting the errors like during made during replication. And then there's the strand direction mi mismatch repair, which is soon after replication. So with all of these, you do not need to know the mechanisms of how they occur unless you're really curious about it, but you will not be tested on the way they actually occur. You just need to know that they exist. So the damage for DNA is usually done through spontaneous damage, so like individual nucleotide de damage. An example of this would be like the deamination of C. Then you also have these bulky lesions, which is exposure to toxic chemicals or sunlight, and you also have double strand base, uh, breaks. So with repair, you have base excision repair, nuclear heart excision repair, and non-homologous end joining or homologous recombination. So these are all methods of repairing DNA and these are the ways that DNA is tries to not get damaged in the first place. This is how it gets damaged and this is how it gets repaired. Okay. So now we move on to the second lecture, which is more on, um, this is the central dogma too. So this is more on how um, we get from RNA and how RNA is produced and how RNA goes to proteins. So here, what we learn about first is the structure of RNA. So the first thing you learn about RNA, this is sort of medium yield in that you sort of need to know it. it's just baseline knowledge for everything else that we do. We learn that it's, string, uh, it's single stranded. It has an OH group on the two prime carbon, uracil instead of thiamine. And there are three different types of RNA. There's mRNA, which codes for protein, tRNA, which carries an, immediate, um, an amino acid for protein synthesis, and rRNA for the structure and function of ribosomes. So something that's important to know about RNA is that it's not proofread, which means that there can be a lot more mistakes with RNA um, when it is made. Okay, so first thing we talk about is how mRNA is actually produced. So mRNA is the first, um, the production of mRNA is just the first part of the transcription process. So what happens here is RNA polymerase um, unzips DNA at the coding strand at the promoter region. And this process occurs when it's assisted by transcription factors. So you don't need to know exactly how these work or what they are, but you just need to know that they exist and that they help uh, RNA polymerase bind to the promoter region of the DNA strand. So RNA polymerase then reads DNA in a three prime to five prime direction. So remember all of these enzymes love to read DNA in a three prime to five prime direction. And this produces this pre-mRNA complementary to the template strand of the DNA. So, and then what happens here is that there's no need for any primer regions, there's no need for DNA helicase, and no need for any of that. RNA polymerase essentially does all of the job, all of the work, and produces pre-mRNA, which is this thing right here. Okay, so after this pre-mRNA is produced, pre-mRNA usually remains within the nucleus where it undergoes this post-transcriptional modification. So what occurs here is that there are these spliceosomes which splice out pre-mRNA to form mRNA. So exons are spliced together and introns are removed. A methyl G cap is added to the five prime end and a poly A tail is added to the three prime end. A really nice, I guess, um, phrase to remember what stays inside the nucleus and what goes out of the nucleus and what enters mRNA is that exons exit the nucleus, introns remain inside the nucleus. So what that means is that 
when it uh, when pre mRNA undergoes post transcriptional modification, uh, the exons are spliced together and they exit the nucleus to undergo transcription. The introns are removed and remain inside the nucleus uh, because they're removed out of the mRNA. Okay, and this is just a nice diagram showing what happens. So you have these exons. These are spliced together to form this, and all of the introns are removed. And then you have these um, methyl G cap added to the five prime end and a poly A tail added to the three prime end. Okay, so we talk a little bit about how transcription is regulated. I think this is very low yield, so you don't really need to know about this. So these are the this is what you learn about the transcription factors. So transcription factors assist the transcription process. Um, activators bind to the enhancer site and simulate transcription. So you've got that here. You've got these act, uh, sorry, activator sites. So activators here binding to the enhancer site, and these simulate transcription. And then you've got these general transcription factors which bind to RNA polymerase. This binds to the promoter region, and then um, the translation of pre mRNA begins. Okay, so now we move on to how translation actually occurs. So the main components involved in trans, uh, translation, so this is the process from which you go from mRNA to proteins, and this occurs from these four main components. You've got ribosomes, tRNA, um, mRNA, and your activating enzymes. So how is tRNA actually activated? So we all know that tRNA is generally what takes um, the amino acids to the ribosome so that they can actually be activated. So uh, sorry, so that it can be added to the polypeptide chain, but we don't necessarily know how tRNA is actually activated. So the way that tRNA is activated is that there's this enzyme called amino acid tRNA synthetase, which links the amino acid specific to the tRNA anticodon. So we know that the tRNA has these anticodons, which are specific to the codons on the mRNA. And what happens is this enzyme here, it links the amino acid specific to this anticodon to the tRNA molecule so that it is specific and correct to the um, correct anticodon. So the next thing we talk about is how these ribosomes are structured. So what we'll learn is that there are three main active sites. There's an amino acid site, a peptidal site, and an exit site. So the amino acid, acid site is where the amino acid and the TR, tRNA join onto the ribosome. Peptidal site is where it connects and the polypeptide chain is elongated. And the exit site is where the tRNA actually leaves the ribosome. Okay, so now we talk about how translation actually begins. Okay, so when talking about how translation actually starts, what translation begins with is an initiation complex. So we have this small subunit of the ribosome. And sorry, just going back one second. So we see that ribosomes actually also have this small subunit and large subunit. The large subunit is what contains these APE sites. And when they're joined together, that forms the entirety of the ribosome. So how translation starts is it starts with an initiation complex. So it's the first tRNA and its amino acid, which is always going to be methionine and the start codon, which is like AUG. Then you have the small subunit and the mRNA. So the mRNA binds this small subunit of the ribosome. The anticodon, uh, the start codon, sorry, the anticodon for the start codon and the tRNA binds onto this, um, this initiation complex. And this releases a lot of factors that result in the large ribosomal subunit joining onto the complex and then starting transcription. So after this happens, then the next tRNA can join on and then the process will continue. Okay. So now we talk a little bit about how the polypeptide is produced. So it's a cyclic process, which involves one, the binding of tRNA to mRNA at the A site, formation of the peptide bomb, translocation of the ribosome, and then acetylated tRNA is released from the E site. This probably flew over your head, but there's a nice diagram on the next slide to actually show you how this occurs. So what you see is that you have this first tRNA joined onto the A site. Then the next thing that happens is the polypeptide is extended, and this um, um, this amino acid is added onto the polypeptide. Then you have translocation of the ribosome, so it moves across. So the one that was in the P site moves to the E site. The one that was in the A site moves to the P site. And then this last one in the E site, it actually gets ejected and moved out of the ribosome. 
So when that occurs, the, you know, the cyclic process keeps on going and going and going and the whole polypeptide is produced. And then you have the end. So the end, there is usually a stop codon and there are three different stop codons. And at the stop codon, there is no tRNA that actually binds. Instead, what happens is a release factor binds to the mRNA, which results in the polypeptide being released, tRNA being released, and all of the ribosomes and other components being released as well. Okay, so the next thing you see is after all of this has been done, you have your protein and you have your, um, you have all of the ribosomes have been um, like dissipated and it's all done and the release factor has joined onto the ribosome, everything's gone. Now you have what is called post-translational modification. And this is the last step of protein synthesis. And I'm going on 25 minutes as well. So I try to finish up as quickly as possible. Um, so you have some things that can happen. So you have the secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. So if you did chemistry, you're probably familiar with these terms. The second secondary structure is essentially the folding of um, proteins into these beta pleated sheets and A helices. And these can be just like different things in the structure that give a protein different amounts of uh, different functions and different like qualities. The tertiary structure is the folding in three-dimensional space. And then the quaternary structure is the joining of protein molecules. And a really good example of this is the hemoglobin, which carries blood. So then you have these three other things, phosphorylation, glycosylation, proteolysis. Uh, phosphorylation is the addition of a phosphate group somewhere on the, pro uh, on the, on the protein molecule. And the glycosylation is adding of a sugar molecule. The proteolysis is cleaving them. So now we've got some more low yield stuff just at the end. So there are a few methods that gene expression is con controlled. First of these is DNA acetylation. So this links into what I talked about earlier about the um, structure of DNA within the cell. So you've got histone acetyltransferase, which binds to acetyl groups in histone tails, and that causes them to loosen from DNA and it increases transcription. So DNA acetylation actually increases transcription, whereas all of the other things here decrease, decrease transcription and the production of proteins. DNA methylation is addition of a methyl group, RNA silencing is like when these RNAs join onto mRNA and destroy it. And protein sequestration is keeping a protein in a separate compartment. And because the, apart, the different compartment has like different conditions, it will have no activity. And then protein mislocation um, is where proteins need certain environmental conditions to function and fold properly. And as a result, when they're kept outside of these conditions, they can have a toxic effect. And I think that's it from me. So I'll pass it on to whoever's next for cellular energetics. Hi guys, um, I'll be talking you through cellular en energetics um, and it's just some background information to really understand um, some major lectures coming up on metabolism and fuels. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so we'll look at the first stop point, explain the factors which govern biological reactions. Um, so these just like some laws that explain how reactions occur. So energy and biochemical reactions is the capacity to change and energy can be either potential or kinetic. Um, and it is important to know that um, like potential energy can be converted to kinetic energy. Um, and the next slide. So these are some more laws. Um, so the first law of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. And the second law of thermodynamics is when energy is converted from one form to another, some of that energy becomes available to work. Um, and just on this slide, entropy is a measure of the disorder in a system. So entropy links to the second law of thermodynamics, um, explaining that energy transformations are not 100% efficient and that entropy determines how efficient a reaction is. Um, and then if we go on to the next slide, so this is like the big thing that I suppose you guys should understand, like with metabolism, um, which is coming up. So catabolism is the breakdown of complex macromolecules. So this is like really big macromolecules, really big molecules with like lots of bonds. Um, and when these bonds are broken, they release energy. And that's why they're exergonic reactions and they occur spontaneously because they have a lower activation energy. Whereas on the other hand, like anabolism is when there's little molecules that um, are joining together so bonds need to be formed and so to form these bonds they require energy and that's why they're not spontaneous because um, there's a high activation energy for them um, and if we go next slide um, I would say this is like a pretty high yield slide to understand that ATP is what couples anabolism and catabolism um, so in catabolism when the 
um, big molecules break down and those bonds are released, the stored energy in those bonds is taken up by ADP to make ATP. And then that ATP is used for anabolism when the smaller molecules need energy to form bonds again. So that ATP is converted to ADP. And so it's just a continual cycle that keeps going. Um, it's really like how the body um, functions by using that energy. Um, and just some background for it is that ATP has a nitrogen, a nitrogen base, which is adenine, a sugar molecule ribose, and three phosphate groups. Um, and ATP is the highest potential energy. So when I was referring to ADP before, it's the exact same as ATP, just that one of the phosphate molecules on the end has been released. And um, that's where that energy is um, added on or taken away from the ADP, ATP molecule. Um, and the diagram on this slide, I think really summarizes this well. Um, so it is the energy from catabolic reactions that provides energy to form the bonds to convert ADP to ATP. And it is the energy released from the phosphate group breaking down that provides energy for the endergonic reactions. Um, and so if you guys like have a look at that diagram later, I think this really explains um, the metabolism of ATP really well. Um, and I'd say this is a pretty low yield slide. Um, it's just going off what Emil said. Um, it's mainly just to understand, like re-emphasize that amino acids, I mean, that proteins are amino acids covalently bonded together by peptide linkages, and that these are all the different structures that they have. But this is just like a background information to understand the next slide about enzymes. Um, and so this is where we look at the next learning objective which has described enzymes, their structure and the kinetics behind enzyme catalysts. Um, so as you're aware, like enzymes are proteins, which I just said, and um, they catalyze or speed up chemical reactions by increasing the rate of the chemical reaction. And they do this by lowering the activation energy um, or providing an easier pathway or bringing reactants closer together, or they can do all three of those. Um, and there's just some other information about um, enzymes there that you can read in your own time. And so this is when we go on to the next stop point, which is demonstrate how enzyme regulation can regulate metabolism. And I would say that the next two slides are pretty high yield. I remember in our exam, we got a question, I think, on whether they were permanently bound or non-permanently bound, but I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so enzymes can, um, the, well, the activity of enzymes can be controlled by the concentration of subset, substrates. And this is either by the frequency of substrates meeting the enzyme um, or the, the enzyme becomes saturated at high substrate concentrations. Um, and so with this, I'm assuming that you all know like an enzyme has an active site um, and the active site is where the substrate molecule binds to. Um, and so if the substrate concentration is higher, then there's more chance of it colliding, like bouncing around and colliding in that active site. Um, but there's only a specific number of enzymes and once that substrate molecule has bound it, has like bounded, it can't um, bind another one. So that's why they can become saturated. Um, and the activity of them can also be controlled by regulatory molecules. Um, and these are, there's three different types of regulatory molecules. So there's prosthetic groups and these are permanently bound. Um, so just some examples of these are heme or FAD. And there's some inorganic cofactors which are also permanently bound. And these include iron or zinc. Um, ions and then there's coenzymes which are not permanently bound um, so these include coenzyme A or NAD and then for the next slide so regulation of enzymes um, can be by either regulation of gene expression or enzyme inhibitors so regulation of gene expression um, can result in more or fewer enzymes being synthesized results in enzymes that lose the ability to catalyze or results in enzymes that can't be regulated. Um, so this all, occur, all occurs, these changes um, in like the stage that Emil just talked about within like um, replication or transcription or translation. So that's where those, that regulation occurs. Or there's um, within enzyme inhibitors, there's irreversible um, enzyme inhibitors or there's reversible. And I think these three are pretty important um, to understand. So with competitive um, enzyme inhibitors, as you can see on the diagram, to the right, it binds to the active site. And so that means that the substrate cannot bind. So then the enzyme um, can't function. Or with uncompetitive, which is the one on the furthest right, it binds to the enzyme substrate complex, preventing the release of products. And for non-competitive 
it binds away from the active site and changes the structure of the enzyme, preventing the enzymes from binding, um, oh, preventing the substrates from binding, sorry. And then last bit, I think this is a pretty low yield slide, um, but it's just to show that there is a feedback system or inhibition that can occur. And so it's explaining that the buildup of an end product can inhibit the enzyme catalyzing the commitment step, thus shutting down its own production. So it's pretty much saying that if an enzyme is produced, I mean, if an enzyme catalyzes a substrate, this substrate can then go back and stop the enzyme from functioning. So to make sure that within the body, like um, enzymes are not becoming too active or that only certain amount of substrates are um, being produced. So I'll pass on to Carolyn. Awesome, thanks Claire. So hi everyone, welcome to homeostasis and body fluids. Generally, there's a, um, there's a bit there's a few numbers and stats you'll have to remember, but most of it is very conceptual. So you'll be able to answer questions at least with a good, strong understanding. So first of all, um, okay, so we've got homeostasis here and you know that neutral pH in 25 degrees is seven. However, when we're talking about patients and in the human body, it's 6.8 instead. And then that changes the way we refer to um, we refer to um, acidosis and alkalosis in the human body. So normally it would be um, 7.4 and then we have plus minus 0 0.04 for a range of different factors in humans. And so therefore it's 7.36 to 7.44. So if a patient had a pH higher than 7.46, you'd say they're experiencing acidosis. And then if it's less than 7.4, they're 7.44, they're experiencing alkalosis. Oh, oh sorry, less than 7.46 is acidosis and greater than 7.44 is alkalosis. So an example is if a person had a pH 7.3, you'd say alkalosis if it was comparing to the neutral pH 7 at 25 degrees. But since we now know that that's not the neutral pH in the, hu the human body, then 7.3 is that per, um, is acidosis. We also know that in our body, the concentration of water is 55.5 moles per liter, and this is constant. On the next slide, uh, and on the next slide, we we're, we're going to learn about partial pressures as well as respiratory acidosis. So partial pressure is how much pressure a specific gas is contributing to the overall pressure. So for example, first of all, the total atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, and that's in the air. But in the air, only 21% of the gases in the air are oxygen. So to calculate the partial pressure of oxygen, you need to take 760, multiply it by 0 0.21 to get this number, uh, 160, and that's the partial pressure for oxygen. And you do that with all the other gases as well. And for respiratory acidosis, it's what happens when we have a buildup of carbon dioxide inside the lung, so inside the body, and the body ha isn't able to remove them in a very efficient manner. And so when you have an increase of carbon dioxide, naturally you'll have an increase in carbonic acid, and carbonic acid is acidic, and so it dissociates because it's unstable into H plus and HCO3 minus. So with an increase in carbon dioxide and an increase in carbonic acid and in acidity, the pH will go down and that's an indicator of respiratory acidosis. So um, while we know that the normal pH in a body is between 7.36 and 7.44, then these numbers are the same coincidentally, probably for the partial pressures of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is usually 36 to 44 millimeters of mercury. And so if a patient did an arterial blood gas analysis and they came up with pH 7.05 and a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 80 millimeters of mercury, you'd say they're experiencing respiratory acidosis. Something that you'll need to remember is fluid distribution and it it's, it's just, um, it's just, they're just simple numbers here.
So you can see that here, 60% of our body mass is water. And out of that 60%, two thirds of that is water inside the cells, intracellular fluid. And then one third of the water in our body is extracellular fluid outside of the cells. But then out of all the water that's outside of the cells, 80% of that is just sitting outside of the cells and 20% of that is sitting inside the blood vessels. And also we've got lots of ions in our bodies, but inside the cells, we have a higher concentration of potassium and PO42 minus, and then those others there are what we have outside of the cell. On the next slide, we are going to talk about osmosis. So you may be familiar with hypertonic, isotonic and hypotonic. Just a revision, hypertonic is what happens when water leaves the cell. So it's left the cell because there is um, there are more solutes or there are more solute, the higher solute concentration outside of the cell and water has diffused out of the red blood cell into the environment causing um, shriveling, causing the cell to shrivel up. And on the other hand, on a, um, in a hypotonic solution, what would happen is water is rushing into the red blood cell, causing plasma lysis or lysis, and the cell has burst. And are also a reminder of semi-permeal membranes. We'll need to know a lot about them because in our body we have membranes that uh, allow some solutes to come into and out of the cell, but other solutes cannot. And that's the importance of a semi-permeable membrane. In terms of osmolarity, osmolality and osmotic pressure, they sound very similar, but they are very different. So osmolarity is about just the sum of all of the solutes. So it doesn't matter what membrane you have and it doesn't matter if it can diffuse out and into the membrane. It's just about summing all of the, all of the particles together. And we count this by liter or per volume. In terms of osmolality, it's not volume, but it's mass instead. And we usually use the unit moles per kilogram. And it's almost always the same as osmolarity, but in osmolality, it's the, um, the membrane does matter. And it does, and, and whether or not a solute can diffuse through the membrane has an impact on so osmolarity, osmolality, but not osmolarity. So that's the difference. And when it says osmolarity does not discriminate, it means that it doesn't discriminate between solutes and all solutes are counted in that sum. And osmotic pressure is different. It's just the pressure required to stop the water from diffusing or the solvent from diffusing across the membrane when you have solutes that do not cross the membrane. And there's a, a few pictures uh, on the slide as well. Next. So here is just for revision for you need to come back. Just the main points would be osmolarity is per liter or per, for, per volume and osmolality is per kilogram or um, mass. And then tonicity is different altogether. Tonicity is about the pressure gradient. So when you have a permeable membrane in between um, and you've got solutes and solvents, it's about the pressure gradient from one side to the other side. And then that is a factor for influencing how fast solutes move from one side to the other. Osmosis. So now we have um, effective and ineffective osmols. So effective osmols are solutes that don't move across the membrane. So because they don't move across the membrane, they generate osmotic pressure. So for example, if you have a beaker and then you've got a semi-permeable membrane in the middle, and then you have solutes on only one side, that do not move across the membrane, then what would naturally happen is water would diffuse from the plate, uh, from the section where there's, there is no solutes and diffuse towards where there is solutes. And that's um, effective osmols. And then ineffective osmols is solutes that do move across membranes and that includes urea and glucose. And we also need to know about dissociation constants as well. So that's what happens when that this is what um when you've got a compound. So say you've got A B and it dissociates into A and B, but only 75%. So the dissociation constant of that would be 0 0.75. 
And that's all for body fluids and homeostasis. Okay, you guys, now I'll be going through um, the fuels. And I think this is the topic that um, everyone gets so nervous about and hears a lot about. Um, but just hang in there. And um, I'll just say, like, if you don't understand it right at this minute, then maybe in, like, a few weeks, I think it all comes together. And, like, you just then can be able to, like, look at it and be like, oh, this is what's happening. So, yeah, just give it some time. Um, and then I think it'll all come together. Sorry, I don't know how to turn off that. Um, so with this slide, um, this is just like a summer, um, just to explain what metabolism is. But with the diagram on the left, I think at the end, if you can like understand all of this diagram, then I think you're 100% fine. Because like this diagram just summarizes everything that you'll go through in the next few weeks for fuel, fuels. But um, just metabolism is the combination of chemical reactions that occur in the body at any time to produce ATP. Um, and carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins are the main fuel sources in the body. And carbohydrates are just glucose in this diagram on the right. And lipids are fatty acids and proteins are amino acids. Um, and they have different pathways to produce acetyl-CoA. And so you all want to get to acetyl-CoA so it can go into the next step, which is the citric acid cycle. Um, but so carbohydrates undergo glycolysis, um, lipids or fatty acids undergo beta oxidation, and proteins undergo amino acid catabolism. Um, and so on the next slide, so if we're just focusing now on glucose metabolism, so I'll break um, like the glucose, the lipids and the amino acids all down into their own sections. Um, so glucose can come from two different, um, two different sources, either, by, either via the diet from carbohydrates and starch or by mobilization of stored glycogen. Um, so there's a pathway which glucose goes um, to which glucose undergoes to be converted into glycogen and then glycogen can be reconverted back into glucose. Um, so it is, when it is mobilized, it's converted into glucose 6-phosphate and then here it has two different um, fates. So in the liver, it will be hydrolyzed to glucose and this helps maintain blood sugar, whereas in the muscles, it enters straight away into glycolysis. This is because in the muscles, it cannot break the G6P down into um, glucose. So the G6P has to straight away into glycolysis um, and this provides energy for muscle contraction. Um, and then to summarize glycolysis, so it's a 10 step catalyzed reaction and it occurs in the cytoplasm with or without the presence of oxygen. And so it oxidizes one carbon molecule, one six carbon molecule to two three pyruvate molecules, um, to two three carbon pyruvate molecules. And there's a preparatory phase, which is the first five reactions, and this uses two ATP molecules. And there's a payout phase, which is the last five reactions, which produce four, to, four ATP molecules. And so this means the overall output of glycolysis is two pyruvates, two ATP, and two NADH. Um, and as you can see on the diagram to the, sorry, to the right, you can see in the top section that um, ATP is converted to ADP. So you can um, see that the that's energy being used. And whereas down the bottom, you can see that the ADP um, is being added with the phosphate, which is making ATP. So that's the energy being produced. And then, so in this final step, we still need to be able to convert the pyruvate to the acetyl-CoA, because that's the, the whole point of this is to get the acetyl-CoA to be able to go into the citric acid cycle. And so this pyruvate has two different ways of um, being converted, depending whether it's in the presence of oxygen or not in the presence of oxygen. So with the presence of oxygen or for aerobic, um, this reaction occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. Um, and this is catalyzed by the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase. Um, and it is enormous multi-complex enzyme and it requires thiamine B. And then, so the overall output from one pyruvate is one acetyl-CoA, one carbon dioxide and one NADH. And in comparison for anaerobic, which is without oxygen, um, this is catalyzed by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, and it is used to convert pyruvate into lactate. And this also has another name that you'll come across, which is called the Cori cycle or the lactic acid cycle. And this is when NADH is converted to NAD+. And so this allows for the recycling of NADH so that glycolysis can continue. Um, so yeah, later on down the track, we'll look at more things, which is, um, important to understand that there has to be this balance between NADH and NAD plus for these reactions to occur. And so that's the end of like glucose metabolism under like an undergoing glycolysis to produce acetyl-CoA.
So now I'm moving on to lipid metabolism, which is fatty acids. Um, and similarly, these can um, be derived from two different areas, either from the diet or from stored lipids in adipocytes. Um, and so this is probably just like a big explosion of information on this side, on this slide, but um, I thought it would be helpful like alongside your notes to have this processed, um, like summarized into a process. Um, but you, yeah, so just, I'll just read through it now and then um, hopefully it'll make sense um, in the end. So when you take in foods through the diet, they're emulsified into tiny droplets called micelles through the action of bile salts in the intestinal lumen. And then these pancreatic, um, pancreatic light paste, which is an enzyme, hydrolyzes the fats in the micelles to produce fatty acids and monoglycerides. So the fatty acids and monoglycerides enter the cell by diffusion. So they move from the intestinal lumen into the cells, like line in the intestine, and they're resynthesized into triglycerides in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, so I think this is like um, an important concept to get. So you have the fatty acids, they're broken down, moved in, and then resynthesized. And they have to be broken down because the um, fatty acids or the triglycerides cannot move in um, without being broken down. And then so once they're resynthesized, they're packaged with cholesterol and phospholipids um, into a chylomicron, which is a lipoprotein, um, and these leave the cell via exocytosis. Um, and you'll learn more about lipoproteins next week, so don't stress on those. Um, or if you had stored lipids in dipocytes, this is when glycogon and adrenaline trigger the mobilization of TAGs, which is triglycerides. Um, and then hormone sensitive lipase cleaves the tags into three fatty acids and glycerol. So the fatty acids diffuse through the cell membrane, bind to albium in the blood and travel to the destination. Um, so again, it's important here to see that the triglycerides cannot cross the cell membrane. They must be broken down first and the fatty acids are what can cross the cell membrane. Um, and then the majority is taken to the liver where it is packaged and released into the relevant lipoprotein. So yeah, as I was saying, lipoproteins um, will be discussed next week. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, so these are lipids or fatty acids undergo beta oxidation. Um, and it's a big like reaction, but if you just summarize it, um, if I've just summarized it down here, so beta oxidation is when you just have like a lipid or a fatty acid and each cycle of beta oxidation removes two carbon atoms at a time or one acetyl-CoA, um, and this process must therefore be repeated multiple times. Um, and so from one beta oxidation, you can get an FADH, you get an FADH2, an NADH, and acetyl-CoA. Um, and then, yeah, if we move on to the last one, so that's the um, amino, that's the lipids or fatty acids summarized. And so then we move on to the amino acids. Um, this is where they're broken down into a carbon skeleton, which undergoes a citric acid cycle to produce glucose um, and then undergoes glycolysis, glycolysis to produce acetyl-CoA. So um, the acetyl-CoA goes into the citric acid cycle, but the carbon skeleton must first get into a form that can be broken down into acetyl-CoA. So it kind of like goes into the citric acid cycle and then comes, cycles back around to then re-enter it from the start. Um, and then the amino acids just undergo the urea cycle to produce urea. I'd probably say that the amino acid metabolism is the most low yield one out of the lipids and the glucose. And then, so as, as I've been like saying, this acetyl-CoA then goes into the citric acid cycle. Um, and so this is an eight step process and it's produced and it is like occurs to produce carrier molecules, which are those NADH and the FADH2. Um, and then this, those are produced to undergo oxidative phosphorylation. And this occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria, of the mitochondria. And the overall outputs for each acetyl-CoA are three NADH, one FADH2 or one ATP and two carbon dioxide. And then, so this citric acid cycle, so these electron, um, I mean, those carrier molecules, which I was saying before, the NADH and FADH, it's so important for these. These are the main whole reason that this process is occurring because these molecules are what then go into this oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP. So the two parts of this is the electron transport chain and chemoosmosis, which is ATP synthesis. So in the electron transport chain, um, this process does not need to be memorized, but to explain it, 
the first complex reduces NADH to NAD+, transferring an electron to complex 3 via ubiquinone and pumps one hydrogen ion into the intermembrane space. The second complex, as you can, you can see as you move along, the second complex reduces FADH2 to FAD, transferring an electron to complex 3 via ubiquinone and pumps one hydrogen ion into the intermembrane space. Um, and then if you move on to complex three along the chain, um, cytochrome C transfers electrons from the third complex to the fourth, and the fourth complex pumps one more hydrogen ion um, in an electron is finally accepted by a final acceptor of oxygen form in water. So this is really important to understand that without oxygen, this process will be stopped. And so it is an anaerobic process, because as you can see on the final, in the final um, step or at um, the complex number four, oxygen must be there to accept um, the hydrogen, the electron, sorry. Um, and so we can see with the electron transport chain, these carrier molecules are organized according to redox potential. So the measure of tendency of the chemical species to acquire electrons. So which is what causes the electrons to move along the chain and eventually be taken up by the oxygen to form water. Um, and so NADH leads to the production of more ATP because it pumps more electrons back into the mitochondrial matrix. And then this means that the final, um, and this means that at the end, which is a really, really high yield point, that one NADH, which can converts into NAD plus, forms 2.5 ATP, while one FADH2 um, forms FAD, only gives you 1.5 ATP. Um, and this will be explained when with this chemoosmosis, um, which is the ATP synthase, which is an enzyme embedded in the inner membrane. So you can see right at the end of the diagram, it's the last step. And so all those um, electrons that got, or all the hydrogen ions that got transferred into the intermembrane space and now um, moved down their concentration gradient out of the intermembrane space back into the um, mitochondria um, to, with the energy that they produce to add the phosphate um, back onto the ADP to produce ATP. So this is high yield in that three hydrogen ions form one ATP molecule. Um, and so probably out of the whole thing with all of these like fuels reactions, it's really important to remember, um, I found like what each reaction produces um, and then what you get out of the whole reaction. So this like three hydrogen ions equals one ATP. Um, so yeah, and then the last learning objective of this section was just to compare on the next slide, sorry, was just to compare energy production from different fuel molecules. And so fats are for long-term um, energy needs because they have good storage and slow delivery. Um, this is because it's like that longer process where they just keep getting broken down each cycle to um, produce the two um, molecules, where will they take off two carbon molecules, whereas glucose and glycogen are for short-term energy needs and quick delivery. So yeah, um, that was a pretty big overview and you'll go through so much more of this um, in the coming like lectures and over this, some of these lectures might be split over next week. So it was probably a lot of information to take in, um, but we hope that was helpful and we'll stick around if you guys have any questions.